Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome back to Wood by Wright. Today we're going to have a little bit of fun because this is a live video where we are doing houndstooth dovetails. Um, and I've had a bunch of questions come up when I posted the picture of this. Wow, do those have any particular purpose? And it's no, it's just they look really good. So <laughs> we're going to be looking at how to do houndstooth dovetails. Um, now I just have a couple quick announcements. I thought I was going to be able to go to the... Uh, MWTCA meet in, uh, it's just outside of Chicago uh, at the Garfield Museum. And unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to make that one because uh, we have other family things that we're going to be going on then. So uh, I can't make it all of them, but I will be going to the National. Uh, so stay tuned for that. They should be sending out the announcement soon. So if you are a member of MWTCA, you should be getting your um, National invite in the mail. Uh, actually, probably come out early August is my guess. So I'm uh, looking forward to seeing that. Um, other than that, I don't think there's anything particular coming up. Most of the woodworking things are in the spring, so it's kind of nice to relax a little bit. Um, right, forget anything? I don't think so. No. So, uh, yeah. Um, just for those of you who know, if you are watching this live, go ahead and throw your questions in the chat, and my wife will organize those and put them out. Um, and if you are watching this recorded, then look down the description. We have all of the questions collated with timestamps beside them. The timestamps will get you roughly close to where it is in the video, so you can jump to where those questions are being asked if you want to. Um, other than that, we normally meet on Tuesdays, but uh, life this week has been absolutely crazy, so we didn't. <laughs> But yeah, let's actually take a look at this thing and see what these are. Um, and I did get my other camera. Oh, I thought I had my other camera. It helps if I turn it on. Um, there we go. Now let's move over to that one. One, two. Ooh, wow, we're out of focus. Oh. Let's try that. Hey, there we go. Now, houndstooth dovetails are um, just kind of fun. They, they're basically like dovetails inside of dovetails. Uh, so you've got this little one here and... They can be a bunch of different shapes. Um, and if they are, um, if they are um, um, half blind dovetails, sometimes the, the tail will actually be reversed around and be on the other side. And I thought about doing those sometime here, but uh, for right now, we're just gonna be doing these regular through ones. And so from this side, they look kind of interesting in that it's almost like a Morse code, fat, thin, for, fat, thin, fat, thin. Um, but yeah, we're gonna be doing that. So let's get this thing apart and uh, start into this thing. Any questions before I get into it? Um, this one's really nice and tight. The there's one from the <laughs> poor man. How long did it take you to get decent at mortise and tenon joints? I have literally ruined like nine pieces of wood trying to build my lathe. Um, I think that the problem isn't decent joints. Most of the time, the problem for most people is that their expectation is too high. Joints will work and be completely functional when they're sloppy. Um, so I, I would just tell people to relax and, and, and try not to expect perfection, um, especially when you get going. There's a, there's a big, big difference between really, really nice joints and functional joints. Uh, and so be willing to, to understand and flex those. Now, if your joint really is so flopsy that it, it won't hold, um, then there's probably some technique that's off because most people will get it on their first or second joint and have a functional joint. Um, so that's, uh, th that might ask me a few questions. Feel free to send me an email with the pictures and I'll take a look at them. Um, oh, okay, Google, set thermostat to 73 degrees. And I'm sorry if anyone's watching on their TV and I just changed your thermostat. I was just gonna say. <laughs> <laughs> but our furnace kicks on. Especially if they're the in like Celsius countries. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, okay, what are we doing? We're making tails here. So I'm going to be wor starting working on the tails. And the tails, when you take them apart, it suddenly makes a little bit of sense here in that it's no longer, they're just, you know, one of the biggest problems is wrapping your brain around it. How do you actually make this work? So we're going to take the other board here and we're going to put the tails in this one. We're going to put this into the vise. And we're going to lay out in the top. Now, one of the, the important thing on this is that your tails are square to the face. And so we need to make sure that that line is square all the way across there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to lay these out. And I'm just going to eyeball these today. I'm not worrying about any particular design here because I'm not actually making a box. I'm just going to eyeball where I want these to go. So I'm going to come in about 3 eighths of an inch or so. And then I'm going to leave, where's the middle? The middle is right here. 
So let's come over a little ways from that. Any questions while I'm laying these out? Uh, let's see, yes. Steven Alderson asks, what sort of wood are you using? Uh, this is the mahogany that I can buy at Menards. And they call it mahogany, it's, it's Peruvian mahogany, uh, which sounds really cool, but it's actually a pretty cheap wood. Uh, it's really, really light and fluffy, but makes for a very good demonstration wood in that it is relatively easy to work with, um, but still shows up really nice on, on the channel. So you get a lot of color contrast between them. So that's one of the big reasons why I like to put it on here. And so once I get these top lines laid out here, and what I'm kind of, let me zoom in a little bit more on this, sorry. Uh, what I want to explain on this is what these lines are. And you probably can't see that. Let me grab a pin here. So I have several lines on here. And normally I would have one line here and one line here. And so that's my tail. That's the, the big size of the tail. And then I'm going to do another one in here. And I'm going to do a reverse tail in here. So it's going to, from the outside perspective, it's going to look like it widens up. So the tail is going the opposite way. So on the main tails, they're wide at the top. And the little tails, they're wide at the bottom. And I want my pin up here to be nice and thin, just as I want my pin here to be nice and thin. So normally, you want your pin on this to be half the size of your pin on this, because these little dovetails in the middle are going to come down about half, oops, sorry. These little dovetails here in the middle are going to come down about halfway. So you want the width of this to be half the width of this, if that makes sense. Um, oh, and the other thing I need is a depth line. So I'm going to get my other wood here, and I'm going to make sure that my marking gauge is set up with the depth right at the right depth. So I'll set this on here, and I'm just going to push this down and make sure that my rod is connecting there. There we've got a depth mark on there, and let's go around this. And then we're going to cut these out just like we normally would. Any questions while I'm doing this? Uh, Mr. Krabs asks, speaking of mortise and tenons, do you ever have problems with your chisels twisting as you're chopping mortises? If so, how do you prevent that? Yes, that is usually the problem with pushing too hard or hitting too hard, um, and it causes them to rotate. And that is kind of a skill thing that just comes with time. You will just break that off. Oh no, I broke it off. Normally I just grab some CA glue and glue it back on. Um, so what he's saying is a lot of times if he's chopping down, as he cuts down, the chisel will rotate this way in the cut. Um, and that is a bit of a pain. It's not a huge problem because you can come back and straighten it. But usually what's happening is you're either, um, you're holding it, let me zoom up a little bit. You're holding it too loosely and as you hit it, the chisel kind of moves one way or the other and that causes it to rotate. Or number two, you're hitting it so hard that it's actually twisting in the wood. Um, and so it's more or less a, a function thing. I, when I'm holding it, I'm literally pinching it just a little bit like this and tapping it down from the top. And as I tap it, I'm just putting enough force in to drive it down a little ways. Um, I don't try and overdrive it. So let's cut these out. Now I want to always think about where I'm going. Now normally I would come in, well normally I wouldn't come in and lay out all my lines with a marking gauge. So I would get like a, a, a guide on here so I could, I could uh, put perfect tails on there, but I like to just do them by eye. So I'm going to set it on here, and I'm going to cut down to that depth mark. And then I'm going to move over to the opposite on the big tail over here. The important thing is that I'm running 90 degrees across the board. I want to be perpendicular to the face of the board. And you may also want to make your dovetails a little bit more um, obvious, so more of a, uh, uh, not acute, what's the other word, obtuse angle. That way they show up more and they, they don't look as much like straight dovetails. Any other questions while I'm cutting? So, um, it sounds like, because poor man clarified that it blows apart right at the end, and then Steve Alderson asked, how do you stop blowout? So. How do I stop blowout? Like this little thing here on the end? Like when you're. I'm um, just being more careful with that. <laughs> well, when you're doing mortise and tenons in general. Ah, I see what you're saying. Okay. Um, so what's happening is if you're doing a, throw a through tenon and your chisel pops out the other side of the wood, it chips out. 
And the way you fix that is you chisel from one side halfway, and then you rotate around and you chisel from halfway the other way. Then you make those lines meet up. Um, and there are a bunch of ways of transferring those lines all the way around the board to get to the other side and put them in the exact same place. Um, but as long as, you, as long as you chop from one side and cut all the fibers on the other side, you'll have less a chance of blowing out when you actually go past. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Uh, oh, here, now the next thing we gotta do is make these little tails on here. And now we have a big depth cut all the way around the board that we put in with the staple one. I wanna come in with a lower cut that's halfway down the board and I wanna mark out the depth of those pins. So we're gonna put a mark on this board halfway down. Let me see if you can see this, I doubt it. Yeah, maybe, maybe not. And this mark will just be halfway down the board and this is the depth stop of the little notch out from the little tail. And then this one we want it to be the opposite direction. So if we came in from the outside here, we wanna go out on the next one over. So every other line, you tip the saw in the opposite direction. Where is my depth? There it is. So I just want to go down to here. Now, if you really want these to be really sharp, you can have a very, very small um, opening at the top. You're really thin pins. So I'm going to leave this one large, and I'm going to make this one a little bit smaller and show you what it looks like with small pins, because you run into a few other problems with small pins. A lot of people really like tiny little small pins. I'm not a huge fan of that, but everyone's a little bit different. So what kind of a piece would you do this on? Whatever you want. It has basically the same strength as a standard dovetail. So functionally wise, it works exactly the same as a standard dovetail. Um, but this is a showy thing. So anytime you're doing like a show box or something of that nature and you want it to look really sharp and cool, then houndstooth dovetails might be what fit in for that. They don't have any different function than your normal dovetail. Sorry, there's nothing special about them. Okay, let me see if I can zoom in on this. Any questions on setting this up? No. Okay, here we go. But behave, your mother's on. Oh no, my mother's on. Actually. You never behave. What's that? I said you never behave. No. <laughs> okay, so I put this on the block, and I have a, uh, um, a sacrificial block underneath it. So if my chisel goes past, it cuts down into there. Now, I need to cut out this pin in the middle, so I'm going to stay away from my line. And I'm going to chop it down. I might need to move this over. Yeah, I'm going to move this over so you can see it better, because I'm all the way on the opposite side of the bench. I normally chop out on top of my leg on the bench. And this way, all the force chopping down goes right into that leg. And it feels amazingly different to chop out here as it does to chop out here on the open bench. Um, even though this is a really, really thick, heavy bench top, uh, there is a big difference between one and the other. But for the sake of the video, I'm going to do this one. And move this over. There. So, we're going to chop in here and stay away from the line. So I'm going to stay away about a sixteenth inch or so. Moving down just a little bit, paring out. And it's going to be the same thing over again, just like with normal dovetails. Chop in, pair out, chop in, pair out. Any questions now? No, but apparently your bench earlier, or I should say even now, it looks like a surgeon's table according to William Martin. A surgeon's table? Man, I don't want to have surgery where you go. Like, because of all your chisels and they look like scalpels and oh. stuff. <laughs> so now that I've cut down about halfway, I'm going to go right into that marking gauge line. I might, if I was being very, very careful, split the difference and get closer to it before going into the marking gauge line. But in this case, I'm just going to chop right in. The chisel's nice and sharp right now, so I don't need to worry about that. Now we need to get in here on these pins. And so this one that I made a little bit bigger, I can... Oh, uh, no, I can't quite fit this chisel in there. This is an eight millimeter, I think it is. Um, and so I'm actually gonna bring over my, uh, my eighth inch chisel. Now this will bring up a lot of questions that people have because this chisel has straight sides, they're not beveled. And for small chisels, it's rare to find a beveled chisel. So how do you get in here? Well, the way you get in there is you just get in there. And you can do dovetails 
with a straight sided chisel. For these little ones I'm just going to chop in from the outside as, a tr as opposed to coming down at an angle. just makes it a little bit easier. And I'm going to do the same thing. Chop down about halfway. Clean out the stuff in the middle. And then I'm going to come back right into my line. And here's where i got to have a little bit of issue is because I can't get quite back into that corner with a straight chisel. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop down a little ways, just an eighth inch or so, and give myself a nice crisp shoulder here that you'll see on the outside. Yeah, so this I don't need the mallet. I'm just going to do it by hand. So I'm just going to chop in a little ways here, give myself a nice crisp shoulder in there, and then I'm going to undercut back in there, and that allows me to get all the way in, even with a straight-sided chisel, without gouging the corner. Now, in this little one here, I did this on purpose because it's a tiny little thing, and this is going to make it even harder because my chisel can't quite come in from here because the pin is thinner than my eighth inch chisel. But the nice thing about these is that they're so small that they tend to break off fairly easily and you can just work them out with your finger. So working with little spaces does that, but if you're working with a harder wood or something that's a little stiffer, like if you're doing this with a maple, um, you might have a little bit more issue with that. And you'd need a smaller, finer chisel, which are harder to come by unless you make them yourself. So there. We've chopped down halfway on either side. Let's take this off, flip it over, and clean out from the other side. Any questions now? Um, <clears throat> Jonathan Cat Moses asks, what brand of chisel is that, James? Hey, Cat Moses. If you haven't seen his channel, you've got to go check it out. He does... You've got to have like a dozen videos on houndstooth dovetails. What are you watching this for? <laughs> he does some amazing work over there. you got to go check out his channel. Um, the chisel I'm using right now is actually an Aldi chisel. No, 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 no. The eighth inch one. Oh, uh, that's a Narex. So, uh, um, I can't remember. It's their cheaper brand. Um, so, it's a relatively cheap one, but it uh, works, works really well for me. It's a, a three millimeter. Narex is kind of like the... It's not cheap. It's good quality stuff, but in comparison to the other good quality stuff, it's cheap. Um, cheap as in quality, not cheap as in as in uh, price. And I've been talking with a with a uh, distributor here soon, and we may actually be working on doing a video comparing a bunch of chisels. And I'm kind of looking forward to that. So now that we've gotten out, we can come back in and clean it up to the line. Yeah. Speaking of. Uh, Cat's Moses, that jig I had earlier, this one, that's his. He makes them. And then the same thing again with the little pins. What other questions we got? Or am Larry Harold questions just too? asked, what are the good brands? Um, well, in all honesty, when you start talking about chisels, and this is a question that comes up all the time, the most important thing with the chisel is the handle. How comfortable is it to you? And in that case, that is such a personal question that it is very hard to sell. It's very hard to tell. You know, this is the one you need. Now, if you start getting into steel quality, the difference between a really, really high-grade steel and a decent steel is almost negligible to the new woodworker. A, a new woodworker just could not tell the difference between the two. Um, that's, that's something that you just gotta, you gotta feel and you have to know what you're, what you're actually getting into to know the difference in there. Um, so for most people I tell them, um, work on, uh, work on choosing a, a cheap handle that feels good to you. And then once you've done it for a little while and you know what good feels like, then you want to go and buy your really good stuff you're gonna have for a long time. Now I use these cheapy chisels that I got from Aldi's for $7 for a set because I like to show people you don't have to have great amazing chisels. These work really well and they're decent. Are they perfect? Are they amazing? No, they're, they're cheap steel, but they're, they're decent steel and they work really well. So don't, don't worry about getting perfect steel or 
the best for the money type thing that's just not, uh, until you've been in it for a while, it doesn't matter. Uh, let me move this over to the other side. Now we need to chop out the last pin. Two. Hey, it's actually pretty close. And so we're going to saw down this. This is just like a normal dovetail. Okay, and if you haven't seen normal dovetails, James, I, really I have more than a few videos on those. We can't really see what you're doing. Hmm? You're so far down the screen. Oh my. Oh, I'm looking at the wrong end of the board. That's why. Uh -huh. there, there we, we go. go. Thank you. There. Is that better? And then before moving on, while it's still in the vise, come in here and just clean it up. This chisel needs to be a little sharpened. Let's use this one instead. And then this one's shooting sharp. What else we got? So George Dargoltz asked, would it be, would be great to see a show of chisel sharpening jigs and technique for Sure, share chisels. For Any what? thoughts? I don't know. What, what did he say? I guess chisel sharpening jigs and technique. Okay. I, I rarely, I, I do not use chisel sharpening jigs. Um, I, I haven't found one. I, I mean, there's a few that I like, but I haven't found them to be beneficial because it takes a little bit of time to learn how to, to sharpen freehand but it is time well worth spending because once you sharpen freehand you never go back it's just so much faster so much easier so much simpler um, and so you are going to have to spend the time to learn freehand sharpening but once you get it it's just it's the bomb so i don't use jigs much that being said the one jig that i do like is the veritas mark ii it also comes in a thin variety for thin chisels, and I absolutely love that thing. It's the, the one I have in stock here. Put that down there. Now before I go on, I'm going to come back in here with a file and just clean up these edges. And I can't get down in there. Oop, I'm going to clean that up a little bit. There's some little burrs down inside there. The other thing I want to do is come in here with a square and check and make sure that my shoulders are indeed square. Like that one I need to do a little bit of work on. That one's good. And that one's good. But this one, I'm going to clean up this right here. So Jonathan Cat Moses says that um, he just met the owner of um, Narex in Vegas last weekend. They're putting together a group of starter dovetail packages for beginners, and he knows a secret about a product Narex is about to release with a propri pro propriety steel. Oh, uh, yeah. I've heard about that. So. That's actually one of the, uh, the steels that I will, one of the chisels I'm hoping to try out and uh, play with it here soon. I want to do a bunch of chisels side by side and do, you know, like uh, the, the Lee Nielsen, the Veritas have a couple different steels and then put them up against the Aldi and my Harbor Freight chisels and see, you know, what are the actual comparisons between them. And uh, there will be very, very big differences between them when you actually compare the steel close up and, and know what you're looking for. So yeah, that should be fun. All right, now we have our tails on here. And we are ready to start working on the pins, which we need to transfer these tails to the pin board. So the way I like to do that is put this into the vise. And I'm going to grab a plane. Here, let me put this camera on instead. And show you what I'm doing here. And what I'll do is put this board down to the same height as the plane. I was trying to remember where I first saw this technique, and I cannot remember. It's been a while. 
lock it down, and now I can move the plane away. I can bring the board over here, and I know that it is going to transfer the lines in there because this is the same height as this. Now, before I go on any further, let me make sure. Why is my camera fritzing? What's that? Oh, my camera just is like going in Oh, it's trying to colors. focus on you because you're moving back and forth. Oh, I'll stop moving. Okay, so then I want to grab my marking knife. I want to line this all up so it's all in the right spot. And then I'm going to hold it down with my weight, mark all the lines that go this way. Four of them. Then rotate my body, mark all the lines that go this way. Three, four, making sure I get them all. And then I'm gonna put, leave this board right here in place with it, grab my marking gauge, and what I'm gonna be doing is this is the same marking gauge I used to mark the depth of the, the, the secondary tooths. So I'm gonna use that same marking gauge to come in here, and I'm gonna mark the depth of the pins on here, so that now I know how far I need to cut in. And now with this in place, I'm also gonna grab a pin here, and I'm going to mark off what I need to remove so that I know which side of the line to cut on. Because <laughs> I don't know how many times I've cut on the wrong side of the line, and it's always the time like, oh, I don't need to mark it, I know what I'm doing. Oh, my camera, there it goes. Whoa. There we are. And now, we can lay these all out. So basically we have, here, let me just put this over here just in case. So you can see, I'm gonna be transferring this image here onto that. Now the nice thing about this <laughs> is we're going to use the saw and we're gonna cut all the way across here and I'm gonna cut all the way across here and at these little ones I'm gonna cut all the way across and all the way across. So we're gonna use this on here and cut all the way across eight times down to the depth mark which we still need to put the depth mark on. Thank you for reminding me. I usually cut halfway down. It's like, where is the mark I'm supposed to stop at? I can't find it. Oh yeah, I haven't put it on there yet. And then I also, uh, I generally won't put out the vertical line on here unless I'm really being picky about it because most of the time you can watch with the reflection and get a really good idea. But in this case, because I'm moving a little bit faster, it's just easier to put this line on here, and this will let me know, is my saw tracking vertical? Because it is the verticality of these that is the most important of anything on here, making sure the cuts are up and down. What other questions we got? Well, follow-up to George Dargoltz's, um question earlier about the uh, chisel sharpening jigs. He said it also would be great to have a show on freehand technique to prevent us from making some common mistakes. I might have to do a, uh, a live on that. I've got a whole pile of videos on sharpening methods that are freehand. So if you want to see those, I'd say go take a look at that. But that might make a good live video here. Now I want to make sure I'm cutting on the right side of the line. Actually, in this case, I'm cutting on the left side of the line. <laughs> And we're gonna cut all the way down here. Now this half pin here, I wanna do the same thing. I'm gonna cut all the way down on this half pin. There's two of eight. And this is one of those times where you can learn one of the great lessons about hand tool woodworking. Because if you, if, you, if you really master this, you're never gonna have a problem with any joint. Um, everything kind of boils down to this one aspect, is that when you start cutting away, you wanna be very careful, and, no, no, no. and see, when you, when you finish up with that, everything is perfect, every time. Just pull it in, and keep on with those, and then we'll have it every time. No you're gonna have. One of the things I love about Roy Underhill. 
the master of the live woodworking show. <laughs> One more. Whenever you get into fancy dovetails, no matter what you do, you double your work. Uh, there is no such thing as an easy fancy dovetail. Now in this case, you mark these little depth marks a little bit deeper so I can see them. I'm going to start, let me see if I can do this here for you. Focus. Okay, so we've got the end board here. And what we're gonna do is we have the, the depth mark here and here. So I need to remove this chunk, I need to remove this chunk up top here, I need to remove this chunk, and then on this side, this chunk, the chunk up top here, and this chunk here. So I need to cut down to that depth and not touch this little piece right here. And so what I wanna do is actually chop down from this side first, and then flip it over and chop out this half and this half. I don't want to start on this side and chop out this half and this half, and then flip around and work down here because I want to stay away from this point as long as possible to make sure I'm protecting it. So we're gonna do the same thing, setting up here on the chopping board. Oh. And I'll focus in on that for you. Please. Got any questions while I'm setting up? Uh, let's see. The poor man asks, speaking of Harbor Freight, I hear you have one of their planes. How does it work for you? Um, no, <laughs> I, well, I have gotten one of their planes. Um, it's, it, it works really well as a boat anchor. Um, you, right, let me put it this way, you can set up a Harbor Freight plane to cut wood and do semi-decent work. The problem with that is they don't stay set up and they're, they're so loose and cheap that they, they won't stay where you want. And the amount of work you have to put into them to tune them up and make them work properly is just not worth it. Um, I mean, as a scrub plane, they would work well, but as a regular bench, train, bench plane, they are trash. So my general suggestion is do not get Harbor Freight um, planes. And I actually haven't found a plane that you can purchase at a big box store that is worth anything more than a scrub plane. <laughs> Alan has just arrived. Who did? Alan. Alan? And he is contributing... He didn't designate the hot cocoa fun, but I am self-designating it to the <laughs> hot cocoa fun. Thanks, Alan. I'll get you your oh, dad joke here, man. Oh, Alan! Why? What did he say? He said one. Fr he has a dad joke, one from him and one from you. And he goes, mine first. What do you call it when Sarah waves? What? A microwave. <laughs> Although I'm kind of honored that I have a dad joke after me, but... <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, come on. That's a good one. I have to remember that one. Thank you, Alan. <laughs> <laughs> Let me switch back over to this. <gasps> so now we've chopped down most of the way. Now we can come back to the line. And I'll get you a dad joke here in a minute. i got a good one for you. Although the one coming on tomorrow's video is one of my favorites. I just recorded tomorrow's video an hour or so ago. And uh, <laughs> it was a good one. <laughs> There's that. Now we've cut down halfway and we've cut down to our depth mark on this middle pin. And I'm not going to mess with anything on either side. I'm just going to pop these out. So we can come in here and take out the dross and take it down to that line. And yeah, I can go right into that line here. Just going fairly quickly here, not being terribly precise. And now we can go back to our line. Any question while I'm taking this? Um, let's see. Larry Harrell asks, are there any brands you recommend avoiding, obviously, Harbor Freight, or brands that, ch that charge more than the quality they're worth? Um, Irwin hand tools I find to be totally trash. I, I, there are people out there who like them, but I have not found one that I like. Um, just... Yeah, it's not worth it. The the new Stanleys are surprisingly decent. They're 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 cheap, but they're decent. And as long as you're not expecting the old Stanley quality, um, you'll be pleasantly surprised. The new Sweetheart brand. All right, let me get this. Let's see. 
<laughs> Ignore the footsteps. <laughs> Why does a queen carry a scepter? Why? Because everyone works except her. Uh, can I please have a popsicle? <laughs> You just wanted to be on the show, didn't you? And welcome to Melody. <laughs> yeah, you might as well okay. grab one for your brother. Okay, let me switch back over to this one. And so what we're going to do here, Melody, go. That's enough. Thank we're watching. You. We're doing Get a video. A popsicle, close the door. <laughs> we're doing it earlier, so they're not asleep yet. So we're going to rotate it over, and in this side, I want to make sure I chop on this side, and then chop on this side, but don't chop out the middle because that's the little piece that we need now. And it's so easy because on the other side you chopped all the way through it. On this side we're not going to chop through it. And I'm just going to pop in from the end grain on this one. Knock out these pieces. Oop, too far. And then down a little farther. And here I want to careful. I don't want to blow out the bottom and break this piece off too easily. Like that. There we go, that's what I'm looking for. And now we can come back into that line. Keep the chisel at vertical, up and down. <laughs> and there we've got our half pin that's sticking up there. Do the same thing on the other side. What other questions we have? Uh oh. We're gonna like, be. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm like way out of screen here. Oh, sorry. I'm being distracted no. by my name and I little think, people. Uh, focus it. There Sean O'Brien asks, that's a sweet looking saw. What is it? That is a saw from Bearcat. Bearcat Woodworking. And uh, he has a long backlog on those saws. Though he just got some new equipment that allow, might allow him to make them a little faster. So you might get lucky and be able to get one. Um, so, we'll see. <laughs> uh, but in my opinion, one of the best saw makers in the world uh, because he just does it's just incredibly comfortable. Uh, and a saw, a saw is a saw. It cuts wood, and some of them are going to cut a little bit better than other. But for the most part, the thing about the saws is how comfortable they are and how they feel to you. If a saw feels good, you're not going to be gripping it too hard, and you're going to use it well. If a, if a saw feels junky, then your hand naturally wants to grip it and hold on to it, and you start running into issues that way. So let's see. There are our pins. Now we can stand this up and do a little bit of the touch up and clean up on this and see how well this works. Now I want to come in here and just like before, I'm going to grab a little file and I'm going to clean up all the faces. Just get rid of any wisps, take them back to the line. This one's a little ways away from the line. And don't push so hard you break the finger, the pin. And then I'm also going to make sure that the bottoms of the joint are all square. I want it to be nice and flush all the way across. I don't want anything sticking up in the middle. Okay, I gotta do a little work on that one, a little work on that one. Because there's some junk sticking up here in the middle. This needs to be cleaned off. There. Now comes the moment of truth. And I want to make sure I've got this the right way. Now, it is very rare that things ever come together on their first try. Unless I say that and then they actually come together because no matter what I do, joints make me a liar. <laughs> So, we're going to try this and see what we get here. Yeah, this one's tight. And it's a bit too tight. So what are we looking for here? Let me actually explain what tight and too tight feels like. Um, <laughs> to explain what something feels like. If I push down on this side, this side moves rather freely. And this side, it just kind of jams up. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to look down in here, and I'm going to see where am I rubbing, what am I pushing on. And I can also pull it out and I can see where is it uh, marking up the wood. Oh, there's where I'm rubbing. And you'll see like these bruising spots on the joint where 
it's sticking out a bit. Any questions while I'm cleaning this? George Dargoltz asked, your bench dog seems to have a leather pad in it. Two part epoxy, I suspect. Oh, right here? That's actually the uh, uh, hold fast. And no, it's held on there with hide glue. So, yes, good old fashioned animal bone hide glue. Um, I've also used contact cement in the past, and they work much better in epoxy, at least from epoxies that I've tried. So let's see what we've got now. Hoop this way. Hmm, that's really close. Yeah, we're gonna get that. It's still a little on the tight side, but now it's still just a hair too tight here. And I can see, as I'm pushing it down, I'm noticing that there's a little gap suddenly appearing right here. And that gap means that this finger is getting pushed out. And because it's getting pushed out, that means I need to remove material on the bottom of it. So, let's wiggle this loose. Don't wiggle it too hard. And, oh yeah, yeah, I can see it now. You'll also see where the fibers were compressed and crushed down. I actually need to remove a good amount of material on that one. Ooh, I took, I took off too much material. Working too fast. Probably have a little gap there. But that's what happens. Now let's try it again. Yeah, that's better. Okay, right, where's my leather mallet? There we go. Now let's squeeze this down a little bit better. And plane it off and show you what it looks like. Actually, I'll just show you what it looks like right now. So here's the the gap I was just telling you about right, where I took off too much material. Can you refocus it a little bit real quick? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Here's the little gap I was telling you about. There's an extra chunk down here. But the rest of it is really nice and tight. I'm pretty happy with that. Plane it down and those will all clean up really nice like. Should we go ahead and plane it down? Any questions while I'm doing that? Um, Sean O'Brien said, my bad ex stiletto dovetail saw arrives tomorrow. Expensive, probably not worth the money, but I wanted to try it. What's your take on them? Ooh, nice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the stiletto is a lot of fun. Um, bad ex is actually uh, just down the road. From, well, not just down, they're up in uh, La Crosse. So they're what, four hours away, three hours away, something like that. Um, I keep wanting to go up there and doing a video on them. There you go. And when you plane it down, it looks so much better. Let me plane this side too. Yeah, the uh, you can't go wrong with Bad X. They're they're top quality good stuff. You're gonna pay for it, but it's worth well, well worth it. And the stiletto is just a really fun dovetail saw. So it's long, and so you can get a really nice good stroke on it. Okay. You're going to need to refocus. Yep. There you go. There you go. I love this wood. You can see the chatoyancy as the color pops from one side to the other. Because right there, the colors almost match side to side. We'll rub some boil linseed oil <coughs> on it. Come on. Oh, okay, fine. I'll put some linseed oil on it. <laughs> so while you do that. What other questions we got? Adam's Cool Things asked, what's a 110 Stanley plane for and is it rare? A 110 Stanley plane. Mm -hmm. I do not remember what the 110 is. Uh, a lot of people throw Stanley numbers around, and there's a lot of Stanley numbers out there, and I don't know them all. Sorry. <laughs> um, I'd have to look it up, but send me a send me an email, and I might uh, might answer your question once I see a picture of it. So let's put some oil on this. Love the way that comes out. The ingrain soaks it up. <laughs> Happiness. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, let me wipe it off. What questions we got? We are 
hot up. <gasps> what? We're we gonna wrap this one up early tonight. There we go. Hound's tooth dovetails. And so you can see the difference between the small tooth and the big tooth. I think the smaller tooth teeth look better, um, but they take a little bit more work to, to work with. And this is just a quick slop shod way of doing it, um, but with a little bit more time and a little more patience and actually laying them out right, they end up looking a little bit sharper than that. Especially with thicker material. One of the common places for hound's tooth is one board is like an inch and a half thick and the other board is three quarter. So you can have much deeper contrast between the big tooth and the little tooth. So yeah, there you go. A really, really fun joint. So apparently the <coughs> Stanley 110 is a low angle plane, a little block plane. Ah, yes. Um, Stanley made so many different block planes that it's hard to keep all their numbers right. Um, it's, it's a block plane. Uh, low angle block planes are great for doing detail on end grain. Uh, so when I was squaring up these blocks, I'd hold them in the vise and then use a low angle. Uh, this one's a nine and a quarter and uh, run across the end grain on it because the low angle makes it much easier to sever all the fibers um, on the, the end grain. But for most point, a, a block plane is a block plane is a block plane. Um, it will still do all the other things that normal block planes do of chamfering corners and doing all the little detail work and pressure run. Um, so it, it, it's a block plane. Cool. Anything else? Um... Oh, what did I do to the thing? What did oh, I do? Oh, no, it's circling. Our internet oh. is apparently. Yeah, apparently uh, the other day I came downstairs and there was a piece of electrical tape on my computer, on my keyboard, right across the space bar. And I looked at it and thought, oh, stink, one of the kids put electrical tape on my computer. And I looked at it a little closer, but there was handwriting on the electrical tape and an ink pen, very, very hard to see. I looked a little closer at it and I realized someone had written on there in very nice handwriting. So it wasn't the kids. What does it say? I can't quite read it. And it says on it, the final frontier. <laughs> oh, it's on the space bar. <laughs> <laughs> I married the right woman. <laughs> what can I say? Cool. Ah, new member, Sean O'Brien. Good to have you, man. I think that's worthy of a dad joke. We could do a quick Love one of those. We'll wrap this thing up. A magician door. was driving down the street, and then he turned into a driveway. Telling a dad joke. <laughs> Do you get that one, JJ? I don't think he heard you. Yeah, I didn't hear you. A magician was driving down the street, and then he turned into a driveway. <laughs> Did you get it, or are you just laughing? I, I'm laughing. Yeah, that's what I thought. Cool. Well, I think that will about do it this week. Um, if you have any okay. ideas for next week's Pause. video, let me know. Pause. What's up? You didn't ask me if there were any more questions the third oh, time. Oh, are there more questions? Well, so Adam's Cool Things, he was the one that asked about the Stanley Low Angle Plane, and it got nicked, so. And it got what? Nicked. There's a nick in it. So is there a video that they should A nick look in the at? iron? In which case, then it's just sharpening until you get past the nick. Um, a nick in the body, um, just grab a file and if there's any metal sticking out protruding past where it should file it off. A lot of people really worry about scratches in the they, sole they and side and most of the time they really don't matter. Um, that's, that's part and parcel for the life of a plane, it's going to get a lot of scratches bye. in it. Um, so bye. don't worry about those too much unless there's some piece of metal I'll sticking out that'll scratch the plane, plug. that scratch the work. work. Um, in that case just grab a, a file or some really fine sandpaper. Give it to me. And we don't uh, eat Nerf gun tips. Sorry. He's chewing a Nerf gun tip? Yes. <laughs> Welcome to our world. <laughs> There's a reason that we normally do these a little later. <coughs> but, uh, yes, I that is his mini me, get though. Do other things. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, if, if the nick is in the body, um, then um, sandpaper or a file and clean it off and just make sure there's nothing sticking out that'll scratch the work. So, I hope that answers your question. Um, if not, send me an email and I'll address it there. All right, now you may say good night. Cool. Um, so next week, uh, Tuesday at 8 p.m., as long as life doesn't strike again, and uh, we'll be doing something fun. So until next time, have a wonderful day. Bye. I'm waiting. I paused. <laughs>